welcome to Hard Fire, New York's Libertarian Talk Show. I'm your host, Jim Lesinski from the Manhattan Libertarian Party. With us tonight is our guest, John O'Hara, a Brooklyn attorney who you may remember from a past edition of Hard Fire about five years ago or so. Uh, John was the uh, first New Yorker since Susan B. Anthony to be convicted for felonious voting. Uh, John, do you want to recap uh, your story a little bit for our viewers who may not remember? Sure, sure. It was, uh, it was quite a time. Uh, I was uh, indicted for what's called false registration illegal voting and uh, put on trial. It was I registered to vote and I voted. I've lived in the same neighborhood in Brooklyn my entire life. I didn't vote twice in the same day or from a false address. I had two places. And uh, the DA made this his most important case. There had never been a case like this before in American history. And no one had ever been tried three times. I was tried three times. It was, I was put on trial. I got convicted. I got reversed on appeal. Tried again. A hung jury. And then it went through all these appeals to high courts because it never happened before. So it became like one of the most expensive criminal cases in New York history. I'm a convicted felon now, why, because I registered because I voted. It was just a why, wild why would the district attorney start going after voters like this? Surely, like he's an elected official, he likes voters. Why? Why would he do this to you? Well, he likes voters who vote for him. Okay. Is what he likes. Uh, I had look. It's I, there was no secret. I had run for office. Uh, about five times, uh, usually against incumbents, and you know you don't become universally loved by elected officials when that happens. And uh, I, you know, grabbed me a week before the election, and you know it's when you're in jail, you know, on been waiting to be arraigned on seven felony counts, you know your your priorities change. So it was uh, was a hell of a deal. Uh, I was convicted and disbarred, uh, put on a chain gang, and wow. fined like twenty grand. And yeah, so you're disbarred. I was on probation for five years. Livelihood. Oh yeah, wreck me, wreck me. I had yeah. I've had better decades. I yeah, mean, you so, know. Yeah. So uh, Charles Hyde did this as a political vendetta. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. made a deal with my opponent. It all came out. Harper's Magazine did an article about it a couple of years ago, and uh, you know, it's a, you know, it, it you know it was out there. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible story, and uh, I guess our viewers may be interested to in, know you. you um, have since managed to get your, your legal your attorney license. Yeah, what happened was uh, if you've been disbarred as a result of a felony conviction, you can apply to be reinstated after seven years. I didn't think it would happen. And I applied after like 12 years. And uh, the Committee on Character and Fitness issued this report. I, I couldn't get over it. They said I never should have been disbarred to begin with. They said the DA would created this trumped up charge. It took a lot of guts for them to really, in the appellate division, they reinstated me, basically saying, you know, he never should have been disbarred right. in the first place. So I got reinstated, and I am a lawyer now. Great. So uh, so congratulations on that. Thanks, thanks. And, uh, you know, this was great. Starting over at 50 is, you know, yep. it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, like, against <laughs> 50, especially one since been ruined by, 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 by uh, political vendettas. Now, so. uh, unfortunately, uh, from what I understand, this uh, Charles Hines character, this this creep who's been the district attorney that we can't seem to get rid of, uh, he this this wasn't an aberration, this political vendetta. He's had other people who have um, crossed his path across the Brooklyn politi uh, Democratic machine and had to pay the price. Uh, is that the case? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's, I think that's what we, we, we really want to talk to about. So then, the and hijacking of Judge Phillips. Judge Phillips. And yeah, yeah. As, 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 as tragic as, as your case was, and it, and it certainly was, uh, uh, Judge Phillips, I, mean, I think, you know, if, if possible, as, as egregious, maybe even more, more egregious what happened to him. You, you did a show about this about five years ago about trying to free Judge Phillips. Mm -hmm. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, just to tell the audience, uh, Judge John Phillips uh, was a monumental character. He was, he was a judge in Brooklyn for many years. Uh, he, he just said he was such an older fellow, you know, he had an interesting background. World War II vet, he was the first black man admitted to the Montana State Bar. He was a real groundbreaking type of guy. Uh, and I met him in the summer of 76 when I was 15 years old. And he was running for civil court judge out in Bed-Stuy. And I used to, uh, I was, grew up in Bay Ridge, and I used to pedal my bike from Bay Ridge to Bed-Stuy. I mean, these two neighborhoods were only five miles apart, right. but they were, they were two different worlds. Sure. He was running for civil court judge, and he, his poster said, you know, vote for the kung fu judge. He was a black belt uh, karate expert, wow. and uh, he got that nickname. It really stuck with him forever, the kung fu judge, which he enjoyed. It didn't bother yeah. him. So, so, so he, was a, he was a colorful figure. He was well. very colorful. I remember riding around in a sound truck in the summer of 76 with the, the speakers blasting kung fu fighting, you know, that, sure. <laughs> that hit song. Uh, and it, it, was, it was terrific. He got elected in 76. It was a 10-year term. 
and I remained. Uh, I was. I was. I always looked up to him. You know, yeah. he. Uh, so he, he was a sort of a mentor to you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, ten years later, they knocked him out. You know, and then he went back. He got on the bench and uh, got elected again in '92. And he had to retire in uh, 95 because he had he reached the age of 70. It's a mandatory retirement age. Okay. And he did a writ of search error to the U.S. Supreme Court trying to challenge that. I worked on that with him. And uh, then his uh, downfall uh, was when he talked about running for district attorney. Oh, okay, so here we go again. Somebody else running for district oh, attorney here in Brooklyn. Oh, it was Brooklyn. horrible. It was horrible. Yeah, and so, so, so what happened to him? What happened was one year before the election, the district attorney starts a secret proceeding saying he's a victim of a crime and we need to seize all his assets. He's a victim of? of there was no crime. It turns out there was no okay. crime. This was just a guy. They go in, they get an order stamped, and Judge Phillips that day went from owning 12 apartment buildings and two movie theaters. He went from being that day to being homeless and destitute. They sold all his buildings except the two movie theaters and just kept all the money, literally. I mean, this is just to make a long story short, that's what happened. And he died homeless and $2 million in debt because the Guardians just sold his property, kept the money, and they never filed a tax return. This is the corruption in okay. the Brooklyn Courthouse. Okay. And Judge Phillips, as there's been articles written about him, and it's gotten out there a little, but it's not an isolated case. Okay. I mean, this is the corruption in the Brooklyn Courthouse. They, the DA's office seizes property, they let liens pile up, and then they sell it in an unpublished auction. Like, Phillips had buildings that were worth 800 yeah. grand that sold for 100 grand. Incredible. And, and it's yeah. not like he didn't have family that cared about him or would, would have been willing to look after well, him. Well, that's the scary part about all this. I yeah. mean, if this can happen to a judge, yeah. uh, then who, who is safe? Right. You know, because I know people hear these stories and they think it's not going to happen to them. Sure. So then there were stories printed about him being under lockdown. Judge Phillips was put in a home and he couldn't get any visitors or, you know. Sure, like, it was for his own good. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, and when you look at the proceeding, when they tried to, he went in there to try and fight it when they were trying to declare him incompetent. And a doctor takes a stand and said that he interviewed Phillips, and Phillips felt he was a victim of a conspiracy by the Brooklyn District Attorney's right. Office. And the judge said, well, he must be crazy. He must be well, paranoid because. Yeah, well, he wasn't. <laughs> surely the, the, the good hearted people in the, in the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office wouldn't really be able to get somebody. That would be, well, that, that sounds crazy. They sealed up his assets. I mean, Phillips had money. Okay, that's what he, and that's how he got elected judge twice. He bankrolled his own operations. And, uh, you know, Charles Hines did not want a black man who was worth $10 million running against him in the Democratic primary in Brooklyn. He had already had a couple of bad races. He ran for governor and law, so the DA was vulnerable. And Phillips felt bad about what happened to me, and he was going to run for DA, and they just seized his assets, and they put him away. And I know these facilities that they had him in, they're called assisted living facilities. Right, sounds nice. Sounds like they're there to take care of him. Well, you know, if they have a court order, you know, assisted living facilities are allowed to confine people. Right. It sounds ugly. You know, it's like these outsourced prisons. Right. But that's the way it happens. So it was devastating. He was in this facility. He was there for eight months in Brooklyn on Grand Army Plaza. And he was there for eight months. And when he got there, the only problem was he needed a diabetic menu. They refused to give him a diabetic mm -hmm. menu. Why did they do that? Know. Nobody, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody could get in to see him. Nobody could get in to see him. We were fighting with him, and his nephew finally gets a court order to get his medical records from him. They wouldn't give his medical records, and the order was signed the day before he died. It was just tragic. Well, he no. collapsed. I spoke to him the night before he died. You know, he got to a phone and he called me, and it was yeah. like he, you know, it was, now, it was very sad. How did this like this assistant living facility now? They sound totally incompetent. How did they get credential to well, assisted living facility? When Judge Phillips passed, I, I felt pretty bad. Yeah. I gave the eulogy at his funeral, and uh, which, you know, quite honestly, I was pretty honored by that because he had a big following. He had a lot of family member from out of town. You know, he never married, never had any kids. So, uh, but he had a lot of uh, support in bed -Stuy. And it was quite touching that all these people, you know, they wanted me to, because they knew I knew him for a long time. And uh, so right after that, I worked to get reinstated as a lawyer, because he kept asking me about that. And I got reinstated, and then the first lawsuit I file when I get reinstated was against the assisted living facility for wrongful death. And, uh, you know, med malpractice. I mean, they have a statutory duty to provide a menu, to provide a medication plan. ALF still like hospital. I mean, they have a duty to do certain things. Right. So it was my first case when I got reinstated. And I went in there, and I'm, that's where it's at. I got that case going on, and I'm, uh, it took an interesting turn. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, this assisted living facility, uh, you know, you would think that they would be 
understand how to take uh, a facility like that, you know, they would get licensed, they would get credentialed. Mm -hmm. uh, not, not that libertarians are necessarily for licensing, but that's the way the world works today. That, you know, you get a, a assisted living facility, you expect, you know, they're professionals who know how to take care of an elderly person. And a diabetic menu is not exactly an exotic request. No, no, I mean, probably, yeah. so, so what is it about this assisted living facility? Why weren't they able to provide for his uh, needs, do you think? Well, this is what happened. The lawsuit is going on, and uh, an article appeared about it in the Daily News, and uh, they, one of the defendants calls, and they're interested in maybe settling it. And I said to them, I said, how can you justify an assisted living facility refusing to give him a diabetic menu? And the attorney said, well, we're not an assisted living facility. We just say we are. We're going to follow up with that, that story in, in a minute. Uh, first, we're going to take a quick break here for a public service announcement. Uh, as I said, I'm with the uh, Manhattan Libertarian Party. I'm an officer there. I've been involved in the Libertarian Party for about uh, 12 years now. Uh, Libertarian Party is the third largest uh, political party in America, and we're uh, focused on reducing the size and scope of government and maximizing uh, people's freedom, whether economic freedom or personal freedom, just getting government out of the lives of people, uh, giving, uh, getting them out of the bedrooms, out of, out of the uh, boardrooms, out of people's wallets, uh, letting people live their lives uh, peacefully. Uh, we, we run candidates for office, uh, we do protests, uh, civil disobedience, uh, we produce a lot of media, uh, shows like Hardfire, like you're watching now. And if you're interested, uh, there are a few websites you can visit. Uh, I, again, I'm with the Manhattan Libertarian Party, and uh, you can find out more about us at manhattanlp.org. If you're not in Manhattan, you can find a Libertarian chapter near you at www.lp.org. So, uh, we're here, uh, again, I'm Jim Lisinski. Uh, you're watching Hard Fire. We're here with John O'Hara, uh, recently reinstated Brooklyn attorney. Uh, and uh, John, uh, why don't you continue? Uh, we were talking about the uh, assisted living facility, the so-called. Uh, it turns out facility. it's not an assisted living facility. It's just an it's apartment building. So it's, it's an apartment <laughs> building that says, we're, "This is now. This is incredible." They just claim to be an assisted living facility. Yeah, yeah, which is a misdemeanor in New York State. Okay, yeah. and how how did uh, the, the judge that gave the sort of committing him? Did he not? Was he not? I I, I don't have where a, he was sending him. I don't have a clear picture on that. The yeah. judge that sent him there, and uh, you know, it, I I. Don't I don't know. I mean, they're called One Prospect Park ALF. ALF is, you know, it's like if you drive up to a building that says hospital, sure. you're assuming that yeah. there's doctors right. and nurses. It's a hospital. Yeah, they would know how to take care of you. You know, if later on you sue them and they go, well, we're not a hospital, we just say we are. I mean, I just, I can't get over this. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's just, to think that a landlord, they, they're claiming just to be a landlord. To think a landlord would take a tenant and not let him out for eight months not let anyone see him for eight months and decide who can see him and withhold his medical records. Can you imagine owning a building saying, you, say you know, no, one, no one's leaving for the next eight months? It's surreal. It the is. story, and Alex Gibney, a documentary filmmaker, uh, award winning, Academy Award winning filmmaker, has been shooting a documentary about this for a while. And uh, it's just, it just surreal. And there were articles about this in the paper, not that it wasn't an ALF, but there were articles about him being under lockdown. And, I just think we have reached a point where we've got just become, as a society, so used to seeing black people locked up. I mean, it that's just... Unfortunately, you're probably right about that. It's just, like, not a big deal anymore, yeah. you know? And, like, now we have landlords acting as outsourced prisons. Right. They're not prisons. They have no quarters, but they're just deciding to hold people and, and, and not just holding people, but holding somebody who's never harmed anyone ever. And needed help. Needed. He had to eat their food because yeah. he was stuck there, yeah. and their food was horrible, and it was not a diabetic menu. And like, but I mean, we've and, gone. And they're doing this under, you know, and not only they're breaking the law, but they're doing this with the con the consent and the uh, expressed consent of the court. They're still getting away with it. Yeah. I mean, they're still over there. They're operating. Yeah. They've uh, and the parent company may have other facilities in the state. And, you know. And do you believe that the, the courts are still sending people there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I guess if you say you're an ALF, people believe you. You know. I mean, I'm here saying I'm an attorney. You're taking right. my word for sure. that. You know. And it's a misdemeanor to right. hold yourself out as an attorney if you're not. So I mean, it's just a surreal case. So when I found that out, I amended the complaint and I included a little stuff for false imprisonment and fraud. And, you know, and then I got their, I checked out their insurance policy. They, they have nursing home liability insurance. Okay. 
even though they're not a nursing home. Even though they're just so department. Uh, the feeling is just why subject yourself to all these regulations and have to follow the rules? Right. Just buy insurance and uh, let them pay for it. Right. I mean, it's, uh, it's a bizarre situation, but I can tell you. I mean, sometimes uh, civil suits can correct uh, injustices sure. that are going on. I mean, we kind of saw that with the Catholic Church. Prosecutors were not touching the issues of pedophilia, which was widespread, and the civil suits, I think, had an impact on that. Sure. And uh, this this case is. Uh, so you it's, think this has the potential to lead to some reform? Well, it's just uh, there were certain elements to a case that collide that make, uh, and this is there have been articles about this, uh, you know, or maybe off Broadway, but there have been some articles that okay. have been out there. And uh, what makes the story surreal is that it happened to a judge. Right. And, uh, I mean, if it can happen to a judge. Yeah, this is not, not, not somebody who is not aware of the system, who's, who's powerless. He, a judge is, like, if, if a judge can't take, protect himself, yeah. you know, who can? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so if you think this can't happen to you, uh, this could happen to I a mean, judge. I mean, if you're watching a show and you're a school teacher, because, you know, I, look, we've, we've gotten to the point where I know what it's like when you're, you're watching someone on TV and you, you see someone's been framed and you say, gee, it's a shame, but you never think it's going to happen to you. Right. But, you know, I've gone from seeing this country in 1980, there were 300,000 people in prison, and I think now it's like two and a half million. Yeah. And there's, there's no end in sight. No, we're the, we're the largest um, uh, prison uh, America has world, by, by, America has more people in prison per person than any country in the world. Per capita and, and in absolute numbers. There's 186 countries in this world. We are number one in prison population. Yeah. More which than Cuba, is, more than North Korea. Well, we're the land of the free. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> and, and, so. And, and, of course, all, and all these people that we lock up are, are, are terrible, violent criminals. Well, you know, yeah. unfortunately, there's so much uh, drug possession stuff yeah, that... Yeah, yeah. Uh, those people hurting the, people by, by smoking, uh, holding plants yeah, and vegetables. Yeah, so. the largest amount of arrests was marijuana or, yeah. uh, in New York City, 52,000 arrests last year. But anyway, so getting back to Judge Phillips, yeah. it's a surreal story. It's bizarre. And uh, I can't get over it happened. And you know something as an attorney? If I didn't see it myself when it was going on, I wasn't an attorney at the time, mm -hmm. but uh, if I didn't actually see this going on myself, like his nephew would take the bus up from Akron, Ohio, 11 hour bus ride, to see his uncle and get turned away. Wow. And get, you know, get on the bus and go back. I mean, you know, and what do you do? Call the cops? I mean, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, there's supposedly orders keeping him there, and, you know, it looks like a respectable building, and, you know, and if the courts are monitoring everything, you know, it's uh, why is it's just uh, it's just incredible. And I, I wouldn't have believed this if I didn't see it myself. That's incredible. And, and unfortunately, with, with you know, officers of the court, you know, the judge that signed off on this order, the district attorney, they have this political vendetta. Vendetta. They're they're immune from, from from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have all this immunity to do it, which you can't is, be sued. Nah, can't be prosecuted. No, nah, no. Who prosecutes a prosecutor? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, uh, if you've got the answer to that, I'd appreciate. You know, yeah. and nobody prosecutes a prosecutor. And we've uh, uncovered. I mean, Phillips is, and while he was in there, his estate was looted. You know, he was just uh, he was wiped out. And uh, the guardians uh, that sold $10 million in property never filed a tax return over seven years. So now the estate has $2 million in tax liens, which, uh, you know, we're working on getting it straightened out. I've, when uh, I got reinstated, I met with treasury agents from the IRS and we filed criminal complaints with everybody. Nothing seems to happen. I mean, you know, when the DA is covering for you, 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 can, you are above the law. And uh, there are people above the law. And uh, what happened to Phillips was very sad. I mean, I'm not just, in the cases, uh, this case is big. It takes a lot of time. And I'm not just doing it because uh, I feel bad about what happened to the guy. I do feel bad. Right. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's one issue. But it's not an isolated case. And uh, this facility, you know, when it gets to trial, if they're facing that punitive award, I mean, they will feel it. And they will, uh, they will hopefully straighten it out. But uh, you know, it's 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 a very sad story. It is, and, and there are probably again there are probably other facilities like this. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, I just can't believe this is not a mom and pop operation. This is a big complex, you know, and uh, there are people there that think they're in an ALF, you know. So, so you know. So so what what reforms would you like to like to see? So 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 that this uh, hopefully and, and I I'm, we're all rooting for you that this, you you will prevail in court mm -hmm. and this. 
facility and the people that, that, that committed the, these, these wrongdoings will get punished. Uh, Long term, what, ref what, what reforms do you think would be I've sense? spoken, well, there's, there's attention on this thing. Yeah. I mean, there are media outlets that are starting to pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. I've been contacted by them because uh, it's, 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 it's a wild story. And uh, I've uh, spoken to the State Senate's uh, council uh, about uh, getting the law changed from making it a misdemeanor to a felony to hold yourself out as an ALF. I mean, th what they did is a statutory violation. It's a misdemeanor, but I mean, I don't know how worried they are about misdemeanors. Sure. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's, it's just yeah, something. Yeah, and, and they're incorporated, so it's like the officers are not. Are, are, are they are they criminally liable themselves, or just the? Corporate? Well, uh, it is a crime. So whether or not we can pierce the corporate veil on this stuff, you know, I mean, they're subject to punitive damages in a civil suit for this kind of conduct. The conduct is egregious. I mean, you know, I just don't think a Brooklyn jury is going to, like, figure landlords can just lock people up because they feel like it. Now, they had an interest in him being alive. They were getting six grand a month to keep him there. Right. And they didn't seem to be interested in keeping him alive. So I have, uh, I've had an order for the last year ordering uh, the defendants to tell me if they had a life insurance policy on them, and they seem to be stalling on that. Really? Yeah, I think That's they. Interesting. Yeah, I think their financial gain was in him dying, hmm. and he died. I spoke to him the night before he died. I called him. It was on a Friday night, and I called him. And every I would go see him every week. I would get in there because I was making noise, so they did let me in to see him. And uh, <clears throat> each week when I would call him, because I would have a routine of going to see him. I think sometimes, you know, uh, elderly people. He was 83. Uh, I think they need some routine in their life. And whenever I'd call him, he would always say, when are you swinging by? You know, when are you going to come by? And I would usually say Tuesday. And I called him on a Friday night. It was like 7 o'clock, and he was already in bed. And he was so deflated. He said, they're selling the slave. He owns a slave theater in Bed-Stuy, the slave movie theater. And he said, they're selling the slave. And I said, yeah, I know, Judge. I said, well, we're going to fight this. And I said, uh, I said, I'll come by and see you on Tuesday. And he said, you take care, buddy. Okay, so he, and the next day he collapsed in the elevator and he died. Wow. And uh, I'll never forget that. Sure. Uh, where, where can peop people, if they want to find out more about the um, this story and this case, where can they find out more about it? Well, I, uh, I, have, uh, I have an online petition. I have a website with some of the footage on there at freejournalhara.com. Okay. And it's your website. Yeah, it's my website. Uh, we don't have a website for Judge Phillips. Okay, but you have some information about Judge Phillips there. Yes, yes, yes. There are articles there about Judge Phillips. In fact, there's a uh, there's a uh, there's a photo of him on the on the cover of the website there about the uh, documentary that uh, they've been shooting. Yeah. And uh, you know, it, it is it is it is hard to believe that something like this. I mean, the story I'm telling you just sounds like yeah, it sounds it, it sounds yeah. You know, yeah, because I think people are going to find this. You know, okay, all right, this is this guy's side of the story. You know, there must mm -hmm. be there must be some other side of the story, but it's not just you. I mean, this is like real, uh, you know, relatively mainstream media reporting on this and, and, and yeah. collaborating this. Yeah. Well, uh, as far as him, yes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember there was like a dozen articles in New yeah. York Post about him being yeah. under lockdown. Yeah. And uh, has has the uh, has the uh, District Attorney's Officer, the judge had, that committed him, had any comment on this? Or? Yeah, the uh, the DA's chief of the Rackets Bureau wrote a letter, published in the Brooklyn paper, saying that they are not bringing any criminal charges against anybody. And Judge Phillips read that letter about a month before he passed, and he just he couldn't get over. And you know, I know how he felt. I mean, look, we're not talking about one or two people involved here. You know, you have judges, you have guardians. You have people who are supposed to be overseeing this stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of people that sat by. Sure, and I, I read these articles, and, and there are people that are claiming that they were his friends, and the reason that they put him in this facility is because you know, they, were, they were concerned about him, and they, wanted, they thought he needed to be taken care of. Yeah. Like, with, with, with friends like these, you know, who needs enemies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just, uh, how attorneys could sell $10 million in property and not file a tax return? Yeah. I mean, I, I just can't get over that yeah. stuff, you know? And uh, I think, uh, but, you know, quite often, honestly, in civil cases, uh, attorneys don't really prepare to go to trial. They kind of move it along. 98% okay. of the cases settle. You know, uh, this case is going to go to trial, and that'll be about a year from now. Okay.
and and expect and then you think it'll get dragged out an appeal after that? I'm sure. I mean, you know, uh, but uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, um, I've dug my heels in on this. Great. And uh, you know, when yeah. I when I dig my heels, in, yeah. you know. <laughs> so, so 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 you wouldn't consider a settlement or. Oh, uh, look, I mean, you know, the relatives, I guess, would like to be compensated, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I, I just think that, uh, I just don't feel they're really going to, they don't seem to be concerned, you know, they're just uh, letting it roll along, and... Uh, yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's a fascinating story, it's a shameful story, it's like another shameful chapter in the sordid book that is, that is Charles Hines. Well, software. listen, this, like I said, this is not isolated, yeah. all right? The, 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 the DA's office has a thing called the Senior Citizens Assistance Unit, yeah. and they go out and scope out senior centers looking for people that have complaints. And if you have a complaint and you're old and you own property, that means you're complaining and they will seal up your assets, yeah. and two or three years later it's sold yeah. in an unpublished auction. It's, it's Orwellian. It's like the, this uh, senior assistance unit. It's like, yeah, uh, we're here to help you. And, uh, it's you the know, Ministry of Love in 1984. I mean, and then your utilities go yeah, off, yeah. your checking accounts are all sealed yeah. up for your own good. Yeah. And uh, if the relatives complain, the DA's office is going to show up. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we're, uh, it's just it's something out of Dickens. It really it's is. Terrible. So, you, you, want, you want to mention that uh, website one more time where people can It's uh, freejournalhara, O H A R A dot com. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, as long as I have you here, there's also a young man who's been wrongfully convicted by the Brooklyn DA named John Juca. Mm -hmm. His uh, mother was in Vanity Fair, and he has a website, G-I-U-C-A. He has a website, freejohnjuca.com, and uh, we're also trying to get him out. That's another story. Another story for another, another story episode. for another episode. Yeah, uh, yeah, you yeah. go to Vanity Fair and yeah, you read you about John. I think we're going to run short of uh, Charles Hines' um, uh, sorted uh, we, stories. We could do a series every week on somebody beginning for so Somebody who got screwed by the Brooklyn DA. Yeah, well, that's, that's a 25-year-old man who was sitting in prison on a life sentence for Jeez. a murder he did not do. Wow. And that's, uh, that's a shame. It is. That's terrible. Yeah. Uh, John, I want to thank you for, for joining us again. No, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, always a pleasure to see you. Uh, until next time, uh, this is Jim Lisinski. Thank you for watching Hardfire.